The HMS Bulwark may have started out as a flagship, 15,000-ton battleship of the Royal Navy, but now it is best known for being destroyed by an internal explosion. Hundreds of men lost their lives in mysterious circumstances, and the ripples of that fateful day went further than previously thought. Yet the secrets and the remains of the great ship lay protected, both by the oceans and the Military Remains Act of 1986. Until now. Today, the wreck is a known diving spot for Willy Scuba fanatics. So today, we are going to join them to find out what makes the history of this ship so special, and why so many of its secrets went undiscovered for over 100 years. The HMS Bulwark was one of the five pre-dreadnought battleships built for the British Royal Navy as a response to the Imperial Russian Navy beefing up its Navy construction. The designs for these ships were prepared in 1898, a virtual repeat of the preceding formidable class, except this time there was a significant revision to the armor. From its conception, the HMS Bulwark would be known for its toughness and imposing presence. And at 430 feet long, with a dread of 28 feet, this beast certainly made a strong first impression. It took 738 of crew to man her on the waves and with that thick hull and weight, they no doubt felt safe in her arms. How ironic then that her demise would be of one from her own design. The HMS Bulwark was based at Sheerness in order to protect the southeast of England from Germany invasion, but on Thursday, 26 November 1914, she was moored in the Medway Estuary, between East Hoo Creek and Stoke Creek. There she was, sitting, waiting for the sign of enemy engagement. At the time, the band was playing and some men were drilling on deck when, at approximately 7.50 a.m., a massive explosion ripped through the vessel. In a split second, a great sheet of flame and debris shot upwards and the huge bulk of the vessel lifted and sank. It was shattered, torn, twisted. So violent was the explosion that the armored boat crumbled like it was made of driftwood. Immediately, the call went out to nearby ships and shores to assist with the recovery of survivors and the dead seamen. The loss of life was huge. According to the CWGC database, 788 men lost their lives due to this disaster. Along the ranks of the dead were six 15-year-old sailors. At first, there were just 14 survivors although some reports contest 16, but at least half would succumb to their injuries in hospital later. One account tells the miraculous escape of an able seaman. He was on deck when the explosion propelled him into the air, but luckily he fell clear of the debris and managed to swim to the wreckage and keep himself afloat until being rescued. There could have been more survivors if the rescue efforts had not been hampered by the amount of debris. The likes of hammocks, furniture, and boxes made it harder for rescuers to get close to the shipwreck. Worse, though, were the scores of mutilated bodies strewn about the waves. This made identifying living sailors a more traumatic endeavor, as they needed to sift through the corpses of their fellow seamen to recover any survivors. In fact, more debris was recorded landing in the streets of Sheerness, some nautical miles away. Reports in newspapers cite personal possessions raining down on the people who had been awoken by the noise. So powerful was the explosion. Undoubtedly, most men died instantly from the blast, but there are accounts of drowning as the hull took on water and death from smoke inhalation, as is typical with any fire. If you were lucky enough to escape the initial disaster, you then had to contend with debris, not just objects falling on your head and crushing you, but trying to swim through the obstacle course would drain your energy and leave you weak to fend off the ocean. Then there was the sinking. Whenever a boat goes under, there is a pull in the water as anything nearby is dragged to the seabed with it. So even if you had gotten this far, there was every chance that you would be pulled back and under, down to the murky depths where the possibility of resurfacing was zero. Needless to say, it was pandemonium in those split seconds. But once the dust had settled, it became time to investigate what had gone so terribly wrong. Just two days after the incident, divers were sent to find the wreck. They soon reported that the ship's port bow had been blown off by the explosion and lay 50 feet from the mooring. That's a lot of weight to send that far. Yet that was the good news. The remainder of the ship had been so violently torn apart that no other large portions of the wreck could be found. And so a naval court held an inquiry into the causes of the explosion. 
external explosions were ruled out, meaning the Navy did not attribute the loss of life to a torpedo or any underwater mine. This is no doubt due to eyewitness testimonies that spoke of a flash of flame near the air turret, and then one or two explosions. Had there been a towering column of water, then they would have had reason to associate an enemy attack. Indeed, the gunnery logbooks, which were recovered partially intact, and the testimony of the chief gunner's clerk would lead them to the cause. It turns out that the 6 inch ammunition magazines were being stored to keep the Cordite propeller charges together that morning. In short, it means that 30, yes 30, unexposed charges had been left in cross passages between the ship's magazines. To make matters worse, the doors were left open when the crew was called to breakfast at 7.45, just a few minutes before detonation. The court concluded that the cordite charges had been stowed against one of the boiler room bulkheads. As you'd expect, it increased in temperatures as the boilers were fired up, which ignited the cordite charges. This detonated the nearby shells and spread to the aft 12-inch magazine, which exploded. The initial report of the court of inquiry was fine to conclude here, but the reports were rejected by the then First Lord of Admiralty, a chap who went by the name of Winston Churchill. His final report pinned blame directly on the actions of the ship's crew and gunnery officers. In doing so, he was discounting the fact that a high proportion of the bulwark's ammunition was as much as 14 years old. This is important because the predicted life of the type of 6-inch and 12-inch ordnance was 30 years, but only under certain conditions, such as a stable temperature. There was extensive testing performed on the ammunition to determine where fault lay complacent crew or dodgy ammo, and essentially concluded that it is quite probable that the ammunition was unstable before it was even loaded onto the ship. No doubt, rumors of sabotage abounded, as expected during times of war, but the naval court found no evidence that such a disaster was due to the hands of the enemy, and regrettable, had to confess that this mistake had fallen through the cracks of the system. Yet these findings were not disclosed to the public until 60 years later. Perhaps the Admiralty, wished to avoid debate or criticism of their munition practices or didn't want to fan the flames of blame that had come to rest squarely on the bulwark's crew. We can't know, therefore, how many other ships were exposed to similar risks before a revamp of the system went underway. But we do know that divers were forbidden to venture back to the ship for themselves. In fact, diving around military remains has been a big obstacle for divers, so now express permission is required from the Ministry of Defense to explore the remains itself. Does that suggest a cover-up or perhaps a wish to keep Navy secrets out of the hands of the enemies? In 1921, a memorial was erected at the Dockyard Church in Sheerness to commemorate the brave men who died that day. The memorial is also shared with the victims of the mine layer Princess Irene, which coincidentally enough also exploded and sank off of Sheerness just one year later. Though the circumstances of that fatal voyage were different, the link with detonating ammunition has a similar ring to the HMS Bulwark tragedy. Both disasters are commemorated as an accident, which suggests clemency on the part of the crew who were formerly held accountable. But with the trail of classified documents as deep and murky as the waters of the Bulwark's grave, we may never know the finer details of what went wrong. But we can be certain that had the investigation not revealed issues with the ammunition, the bulwark may have been the first in a long line of maritime disasters. For that, we can salute the sacrifice of those brave sailors. But who do you think is responsible? Let us know in the comments. If you'd like to see more videos like this, then please leave a like. Don't forget to share this with any history buff and be sure to subscribe to be the first to see our next video. Thanks for watching.